When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, for your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. And so forth and so on. Well done. Thank you for that. I heard this beautiful song when, this comforting and inspiring song from Oscar, uh, Oscar Hamilton and Richard Rogers when I was eight years old. I was living in Belport, Long Island, New York, and my mother was active in the local music theater. My mother, like her very own Deacon Stacy, was a professionally trained opera singer, for those who knew her, and had the privilege of sitting behind her in church or in front. You could attest to that. And she landed the role of cousin Nettie. And I, along with my brother, were cast as two boys playing marbles. I still remember my blocking. <laughs> For those of us who are familiar with that musical, and those who aren't, Cousin Nettie helps lead character Julia Jordan. He helps her to cope with the death of her husband, Billy, who died of a self-inflicted knife wound. Much to her regret, Julie never told Billy that she loved him while he was alive. To garner inspiration and hope, Judy, Julie heroically attempts to sing that song, You'll Never Walk Alone, her voice breaks, she loses her thoughts. She's too emotionally shattered to finish it. So Cousin Nettie intervenes and sings that song, You'll Never Walk Alone. Now how it ended up being a ballad at soccer games in England, I don't know, but it is a powerful piece that I could not help but to think about, about its profundity and its meaning during these tempestuous times in which we find ourselves. We find ourselves tossed about amid the waves of human brokenness, where one can indeed find themselves feeling like Julie, arrested and forlorn, fearful and doubtful, struggling to find words, to find meaning, to make sense of what is happening in this nation and the world. A nation that has become unmoored from reason, civility, a sense of commonality and shared purpose and identity, who this very weekend on this eve will be celebrating our independence at the same time where women are losing their rights to choose to do what they want to do with their own bodies. And I don't care what anyone says, if you take away someone's choice, you take away their freedom. We are in, it seems, a state of moral and spiritual and intellectual and environmental retrograde. We're forging and navigating a hopeful pathway forward through this thicket of stuff has become increasingly more and more difficult by the day. And it can leave one feeling vulnerable and exposed and fragile and isolated, impotent and alone. And what I love about this song and the interplay between these two characters, Nettie and Julie, where Nettie lifts Julie up, is that it serves as a wonderful reminder that we do not face these trials and these tribulations. We don't have to navigate the pathway forward alone. It reminds us that there is hope, that there is indeed light shining amidst the darkness, that there is goodness worth seeking and striving for and fighting for, living for. The song reminds us of the power of togetherness. This, I believe, 
was at the heart and the root of the message that those seven disciples who were commissioned in today's gospel to share. This is what I believe that message was as they went door to door. Note the gospel doesn't say that they were to go door to door asking if people were saved or to give them a pamphlet talking about the end times. Nor does it say that they were to build beautiful edifices and sit back and expect people to show up to them. No, Jesus commissioned these individuals, men and women alike, to bring his shalom, his agape, his peace and love out into a broken world that was and is in desperate need of it. To go out to a people arrested and governed by fear, lost in that despair, trapped under the weight of corruption and oppression and human degradation. The message that these disciples shared in words and deeds, that shalom and agape, that message was to say, in essence, this is where your hope lies, in Christ, in God, in love. Only God has the power to reconcile and to heal and to liberate and to resurrect, to change hearts, to turn upside down systems right side up. Only God's love can redeem and save. Only God's love can pierce the pall of darkness of despair that has enshrouded us. And knowing that this radical, countercultural, counter-religious, counter-intuitive message would be met with resistance and hostility and outright violence, knowing that there would be those powers and principalities that would be hell-bent on maintaining the established order of the oppressed over the oppressor, rather the oppressed over the oppressor, you get what I'm saying, the haves and the have-nots, knowing that fear is a powerful motivator, knowing that evil is real, knowing that we human beings are a stubborn and fallible lot. Jesus made it very clear to those disciples what they were in for. What would we required of them? That they would be lambs sent out in the midst of wolves. He let them know that they would be few in a world of many and that they would be rejected and reviled by friends and strangers alike that they would possibly, most likely, die. But he let them know, in it all and through it all, that they were not alone. And with that knowledge, these 70 faithful individuals stepped up and stepped forward, saying, in essence, here I am, send me, send us. And through their willingness to give of themselves that others may have, that others may know the peace and love of Christ. The fact that they were willing to step up is a testimony in and of itself of what they themselves experienced. That love, that peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding, that peace that gives strength amid weakness, that gives courage in the midst of fear, light amid the darkness, and hope amid despair. Peace was the compass Peace was their sustenance. Peace was alive in their lives, Christ's peace. And it was their identity. And they didn't want to keep it to themselves. They wanted to share it with others, together. And so they went out, not armed with weaponry or stacked with cash with a huge endowment, with those creature comforts that they could use to barter and sell or that would possibly inflate their ego. They did not have flow charts with stats and five-year plans. Did not look for the best hotels to stay in. Rather, they stepped out in faith, trusting that Christ's peace, Christ's love would be enough for the journey, for the work. And so they relied on the hospitality of others, staying in their homes, being present, going out, being in those places where they were welcomed, eating whatever was given to them, 
I feel sorry for the disciple in the group that was the vegan. <clears throat> Do you have any beans? <laughs> Lamb? <clears throat> As the gospel tells us, they went out together and they were successful. They cast out demons, they healed the sick, they forged real relationships to the breaking of bread, and they returned to Jesus with joy in their hearts. And we need to contrast this experience with the experience of other disciples in Matthew's gospel where they were sent out with the same mission, but they failed scratching their heads, upset that they couldn't cast out those demons, and Jesus knew why. Their faith was waning. They didn't trust. They were too busy looking at the mistakes in the bulletin or worrying about the length of the sermon rather than being focused on the mission. The joy that these disciples experienced came from being empowered by the Jesus' love and peace. Their joy came from discovering that as ordinary, vulnerable human beings, as fragile as they were, that they could accomplish great and small things alike in and through Christ. Their joy came from seeing people move from hurt to healing, from that despair to a place of hope, from darkness to light. Their joy came from being able to suffer the slings and arrows of criticism, and rejection, knowing and holding on to their identity as disciples, peace bearers. It was that knowledge and that gave them ability to say, you can call me whatever you want. I know who I am, and I know whose I am. You may be about hate, but we are going to be about love. The disciples' joy came from being together. No Christian is an island. And that is why Jesus sent those disciples out in pairs. Because God's way, God's work is relational. God's being is triune. And God's work and God's will is accomplished through us and with us. It doesn't happen by magic. It happens through us, through faith, through our peace and our love, through our willingness to step up and to serve and to give. That is how peace and love is achieved. And it is so important in these challenging and turbulent times for us not to lose sight of that. You see, because I believe that along with sharing and giving witness to the truth of God's love, that is also at root about taking care of one another. That effective discipleship, impactful discipleship, depends on us showing up for one another, supporting one another, inspiring one another, lifting each other up if the other one should fall. Well, I, I want to go back. I, I want to give up. No, you're going to go forward with me. I've got you. Now, if we, want, if we both will go back, we're in trouble. Take my hand. I'm with you. You're not alone. I cannot tell you over the 22 years that I've been a priest how resurrecting and reassuring it is to hear a fellow disciple, a fellow church member, Say, hey, Father, how are you doing today? How can I help? What do you need me to do? Father, I have an idea how we can help our community. These words, these sentiments are like hearing Nettie's song. In those moments when I wanted to give up, when I felt overwhelmed, when I felt like I was shouting in the wind and trying to take on the world by myself, to have someone come up and say, I am with you, brother. Especially for me in, in the light of the Buffalo shootings and all the racialized stuff, to know that I can come into this place and receive your love, that gets me up in the morning. That gives me hope for my children 
for this world, for this nation. Nettie's song, walk on, walk on. Ours is a shared ministry. Ours is a shared identity, and every one of us, young and old, rich and poor, Republican, Democrat, whatever, if you are a follower of Christ, our work is about peacemaking and love giving and love sharing. Because sometimes in the life of the church, we sometimes forget that part of it. For some, church is a noun rather than a verb. Something you go, you go to or you don't go to, rather than something you do and something that you are. In the institutional church, the Episcopal church in particular, we are obsessed with average Sunday attendance. Right now, this is a successful Sunday. If there were 30 people sitting here, I'd be like, oh man, what did I do wrong? We're worried more about getting money into the plate, which has its importance, yes. But we're not doing enough, in my humble opinion, to form disciples, to foster opportunities for us to build lasting and impactful relationships, to hear each other's faith stories of how we dealt with suffering and adversity, how God touched our lives in one way or another. Because truth be told, I would rather have a church full of 30 faithful, committed individuals who show up day after day, week after week, ready to give and to serve and to support one another than a church with 300 people who ain't doing nothing but watching a show. That is not going to change the world. And in all fairness, the church has made strides to form disciples a little bit. We need to do more. But I beg you, I beseech you, when these things, these opportunities arise in the life of the church for you to learn and grow and serve and give, come forward and be present. Don't find yourself too busy or preoccupied because the world is not going to change without you. And God has shown us that no matter where we are in life, whether we're working or retired, God can use us, our hands and our heart, our voice. And so my sisters and brothers, I pray that we will continue to show up together and to go out in the world together. Because one of the things we have seen and we're seeing and going to see, unfortunately, all the more, is when we don't show up and do the work of peace and love, you get Christian nationalism which has nothing to do with Christ's peace and his love. It's all about power and control. But we need to bear witness. And we cannot just go out there and do it by ourselves. We are in this together. Because there are a lot of Julies out there who are struggling to sing, to find their voices, who feel that no one cares, that they are alone. So it's my hope and prayer that we will step up anew today with hands raised, arms open, to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Teach me a new song that I may sing it in this strange land. I pray that we will be peacemakers, love bearers, and that God his peace we known through our lips in our lives. Amen.